thank you so much, Scott. And thank you so much, Justin, for being here with me. I'm so excited because we now have the ESC updated heart failure guidelines. For the first time, we have a guideline-directed medical therapy for HEFPEF. Yay! And it's frankly thanks to a lot of work that you've done. Um, but we can now treat it with a class one therapy. I think that actually behooves us to then detect and diagnose the condition earlier, right? So, I don't know. What do you think is the main problem? Why, why aren't we finding these cases? Well, we're not finding these cases uh, sometimes because we aren't looking under the right stones. Um, you know, the, many of the patients with heart failure, uh, and especially preserved ejection fraction, aren't declaring themselves the way patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction are. They uh, Often they don't see cardiologists. They live yeah. with internists and primary care physicians. Mm -hmm. And um, they need to be able to uh, know that this is a patient who might have heart failure who should be potentially referred to a cardiologist for these guideline directed medical therapies that now exist yeah but don't you think now if we make a diagnosis of heart failure you could actually if you're sure of it start treating and then the guidelines honestly just say to make a diagnosis of heart failure we need symptoms and signs we need to know the ejection fraction is whatever it is, and then find some objective evidence that the symptoms are coming from the heart, right? So why can't we do this at a GP level, or for example? What, what do you think? So there's a couple problems, and there's always solutions. Um, the biomarkers have been great. They've actually yeah. got paved the way because, you know, things like nt probing just being available, that's the simple thing. And in the hands of the right people, as in family doctors, internists, you name it, that actually helps, like, get things going. The other issue is access to imaging around the world is different from in, in different countries, different geographical locations within countries. So the access to imaging is a real barrier for a lot of centers. Can you get, can you get simple things? Yeah. Like, can you get an echo? Can you get a high quality echo? Can you get uh, that echo in a timely fashion? And that, that really has been a barrier for, I think, most health systems, not so much the very high end, you can get it tomorrow. Most of the world, it's, it's weeks to months down the road. And, and even then, you're wondering about the quality and fidelity of the images. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's kind of reminding me, though, of in the bad old days, even an EKG to diagnose an MI could be a big problem. Um, um, but, you know, we've managed, if I, if I could say, with some AI and automation to, to put that in the hands of, of primary care. Echo, of course, uh, I, I'd love to chat about that. But in the first place, what about the argument that do we even need an echo anymore? This things work no matter what. So what do you think? Uh, I, I absolutely <laughs> think we need an echo. And we need an echo for a number of reasons. Um, we need an echo because, um, first of all, we really do, uh, at this point, need to understand whether a patient has heart failure with reduced or preserved ejection fractions. The treatments are different. The guideline-directed medical therapies are different. Um, for example, with HEFREF, we would want a patient to be on a beta blocker. We probably want that patient to be on Sacubitril, Valsartan, an MRA, and an SGLT2 inhibitor. With heart failure, with uh, mildly reduced or preserved ejection fraction, the evidence-based uh, guidelines currently uh, include SGLT2 inhibitors, um, plus or minus some other things that we have the option to use, especially in the lower, um, mid-range, mildly reduced heart failure uh, patients. I also think it's important in, um, in HEFPEF because we are still not great at being sure that these are patients who have the heart failure syndrome. Yeah. Um, when a patient shows up with shortness of breath and even some edema and uh, they tell me that they can't walk up a flight of stairs, um, even if the uh, NT bro BNP is a little elevated, I want to know that there's a problem with the heart. Yeah. I want to know that the, you know, so I will look at the ejection fraction, but I'll also look at the left atrium. Um, I'll also look at some of the uh, diastolic indices, yeah. even though they're not Mind necessary uh, and so forth. And we, we do that because we want to know that this patient has a, a problem with their heart and not one of these other things that can mimic the same signs and symptoms. Uh, of heart failure. Yeah. Or even to look specifically for the mimickers, right? I mean, oh, our, yeah. our world, yeah. 
amyloid, hypertrophs, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, viral disease, and so on. So at, in, in that sense, thanks, Justin, you anchored that Lancet Digital Health paper. You know, I, I really think it's got some important messages. I mean, what, what is the message from that in the context of what we just talked about? You know? Sure, so I mean, a couple of key things are, um, you know, if you're going onto the stream of how do we detect heart failure for, uh, faster or better, and you want to think how is our time to triple or quadruple therapy, then you have to have the measurements by which to do so on imaging. And I think the validity of the measurements of, from that, that's the paper, it says, are the measurements in, um, when you go into an AI world, the measurements are of high validity. And I think that's what a clinician's got to know is, can I trust these measurements? So the paper really gets at, if you take you know multiple cohorts and you keep testing versus expert human readers, you, you see the message again and again, it's as good, if not uh, better than humans. And part of that is less variability. And so each of those images and, and numbers, we need to trust the validity to get down to the downstream to detect heart failure means we can, because we can trust the images and the numbers coming from that. And I think that message came through from just doing it in multiple cohorts again and again. You, you compare it to the gold standard, which is Dr. St Dr. Scott Solomon's Echo yeah. Lab, and you say, well, that's the gold standard. If it's as good as that, I'm, I'm pretty happy in clinical care to trust the numbers we're getting from AI. Yeah. Do you want to elaborate on your gold standard core lab, what you guys did over well, there? Well, you know, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're testing um, and looking at, especially at um, meetings like the ESC, um, some wonderful new AI platforms uh, for all of cardiovascular uh, diagnosis. And um, what we have to do when we, when we uh, you know, think about how to incorporate AI into our practices, we have to understand how does it work compared to the way we have been doing things for yeah. you know, many, many years. So um, we were very excited to be able to uh, actually validate um, the S2 AI algorithms in our core lab um, by comparing uh, the, the software, the AI-based measurements to three sonographers who were um, you know, trained to do this and were doing this day in and day out um, on patients with real heart disease. And the, um, the results were fabulous. As you know, they're now published in um, Nature communi Communications. And um, we have uh, certainly used that as the anchor for moving forward with um, utilizing AI in a broader way in the core laboratory. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that. So the validation in a core lab and then the external validation in real world, very diverse, huge cohorts around the world. When I first suggested, or when you first heard that AI could potentially do this, what did you really think before you went to oh, test it? Did you I was think, so you, skeptical. I, I, I know, actually, I could feel it. I, I said, you know, people have been trying to do this for a long time. Yeah. I don't think it's going to work. Um, I was, I was, I was very skeptical, but I have come around to realizing that not only does it work, but we absolutely need this. We need this. Spending um, too much time, yeah, because, wasting. Uh, look, if if a sonographer could spend all their time imaging yes. and not making measurements you could increase the throughput in most echo labs that have long waits of you know six to eight weeks to get somebody in uh, you can double the throughput potentially in a lab in, in the research setting there are all sorts of um, uh, efficiencies as well so i think this is the way we have to go and of course using this connected to handheld devices so that you can um, uh, do this in the field do this in um, in doctors offices is going to be crucial and, and were you surprised, by the way, at the performance in the real world? I mean, those are some real, real world echoes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, I, I, uh, I was I surprised. I, I don't think I was just surprised because I thought we're going to get there. I just don't know how soon, but oh. it's trust but verify. And I think the verification is what really anchored. It's like I, we're going to get there if it's in like my lifetime or hopefully not the end of my lifetime. We're going to get there. It was way earlier than I thought. So it's more like a, a verify, but trust but verify. And I think in like the end game here is, you know, if we're going to try to detect and treat heart failure over here as a clinician, 
we are like so much closer on that pathway now than we were like even when I started I, as a you know a fellow or we're so much closer because NT Pro BMP was a like a miraculous breakthrough but now this like is just like we, we're just so much closer like Echo becoming an AI uh, to like a tool as a like a, um, that is AI driven now we can do algorithms now we can actually in my lifetime I have no doubt by the time I retire it's not going to be me doing this is going to be a lot more automated across the board, which is fantastic for patients. That's the goal. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank you so much, Scott. I, I just really can't thank you enough.